Shalom again. We continue the second segment of my teaching on being a friend of Yahweh or friend of God. So I want now to share with you or look at the example in the Bible of a very, very closely knit friendship between King David and Jonathan. Of course, the friendship started uh, even before he became king. So let's look at some uh, Bible verses on this subject, see what we can learn. If you turn to 1 Samuel chapter 18, reading from verse 1 to 3. And it came to pass, when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Then Saul took him that day, would not let him go no more home to his father's house. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant, because he loved him as his own soul. And then you turn to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 4. 1 Samuel chapter 20 and verse 4. Then said Jonathan unto David, Whatsoever thy soul desires, I will even do it for you. So, what does this close-knit relationship between Jonathan and David have to teach us about our relationship with our Saviour? with our God, with Father Yahweh. Now, I just want to insert a note that you want to be aware of, and that is in LGBT circles, uh, those who uh, proclaim themselves to be Christian, they, uh, they use the example of Jonathan and David to say that, hey, look, uh, two guys can love each other so closely, so what's wrong? with two men loving each other closely and two women in in the LGBT relationship. Now that, of course, we know from other verses in the Bible that LGBT is a terrible sin in Father Yahweh's eyes. And Sodom and Gomorrah got destroyed because of the sins of LGBT. All right. So back now to the proper relationship that David had with Jonathan. Lesson number one we learn is that our soul, the mind, emotion, the will, must be closely knitted with our Savior, knitted together with our Savior. Number two, we must love him as our own soul which is exactly what Jonathan and David love each other as their own soul. Now, where does this come from? If you look at the, uh, the two great love commandments, the very first one, and look at Mark's version, chapter 12, verses 29 to 30, Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, Yahweh, our God is one Yahweh, is one God. And thou shalt love Yahweh thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. All thy soul. The soul comprises the mind, the emotions, the will, the strength that we have, whatever is within us and the emphasis is on the word all holding nothing back okay then the third important lesson we learned from the jonathan david relationship was covenant that jonathan made a covenant with david or both of them made a covenant of each other a covenant is a promise a very solemn promise for each of the two of them uh, to take care of each other or whatever they covenant to do together. So we must covenant with Yahweh. 
he has his covenant with us at the last supper at the institution of holy communion this is the covenant in my blood this is the covenant the new covenant is the same as the old covenant with two qualifications one the old covenant the commandments were written on tablets of stone the new covenant the commandments are written on hearts and minds written on hearts and minds next difference the old covenant the commandments the torah could not save anybody why because people had the old carnal nature the flesh to contend with for us, we have in the rebirth became a new creation, new heart, a new spirit that can be responsive to Yahweh and His Holy Spirit. And even more important, we have the Holy Spirit, a teacher, our guide, and our enabler. That's what grace is all about. The grace. The divine power to enable us to walk in the ways of Father Yahweh. So this is the covenantal relationship that we ought to have with Father Yahweh. Okay, so you can see how the relationship that Jonathan had with David gives us the essentials for our relationship with Father Yahweh. Next, I want to draw your attention to a very interesting incident in the very last chapter of the Gospel of John where, where scripture deals with the restoration of Peter. Now you may recall that in the Garden of Gethsemane and the aftermath of the trial and torture and death of Yeshua, uh, Peter was among the people, few people following. He was identified as a follower of Christ, but he denied Christ three times. Three times. So he had to be restored. I will give you, I'll give you the verses that deal with the restoration. And in it, we'll see the very important lessons for us. <clears throat> Turn to John's Gospel, chapter 21. <clears throat> I read from verses 15 to 19. So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me more than these? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my lambs. 16. He said to him the second time, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? He said unto him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said unto him, Feed my sheep. Verse 17, And he said unto Peter the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved, because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, Feed my sheep. Verse 16, Verily, verily, I say unto you, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walk whither thou wouldst. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldst not. Thus spoke he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto him, Follow me. Now, Unfortunately, the English rendition, translation, or version of this event that I just quoted to you does not do justice and does not reveal the true underlying um, doctrines that are coming forth. Okay, so let me insert the relevant uh, Greek words and the meaning of those Greek words in the appropriate places. So you are going to see that in this fascinating exchange, Yeshua actually asked Peter twice whether he agapau 
him. And he asked him the third time whether he follow him. All right? So, watch carefully. In John 21, 15, do you agapao me more than this? So the word agapao is used, related to the word agape, the kind of love that the Father gave us to his son Yeshua. But look at the response of Peter. He was asked, do you agapao me? Peter says, I feel you. <laughs> Two different Greek words. What did Yeshua mean and what did Peter mean? Okay. Then verse 16, again, Yeshua said, Do you agapau me? And again, Peter replied, I feel you. And the third verse, this time Yeshua said, Do you feel me? And Peter says, Yes, I feel you. So in the third exchange, the third time, both were on the same wavelength. So what is this all about? And in between, of course, in all three verses, you got feed my lambs and, and then feed my sheep. Even the Greek words for feed my sheep, quite different. Let me explain. But let me deal with the agapao issue first. Yeshua was clearly asking Peter, what kind of love do you have for me? Yeah, if you put it this way, you, it makes things easy to understand. What kind of love do you love me with? Peter says, friendship, friendship, friendship. Which is exactly what Yeshua wants. Because the third time he says, do you befriend me? Are you my friend? And Peter says, I am your friend. So the meeting ground is, I'm your friend. The response is, I'm your friend. You get the idea? Now, you may be sure that Peter didn't give his answers frivolously. He understood what friendship was. Because remember from John chapter 15, to which uh, Peter was there listening to the teachings of Yeshua, where he learned that friendship was what Yahweh is seeking from us. And the elements of friendship that we talk about in the first part, in the first uh, part one of this video, obedience, do you obey me? And how do you love me? With all your soul, with all your heart, and so on? Will you lay down your life for me? You can see that? Will you lay down your life for me? That's critical. And can I share my secrets with you? Okay. Obedience, laying down the life, and can you be my confidant? I will share my deepest secrets which I learned from the Father. I'll share with you. Are you ready for that? Do you qualify to be a confidant? Because if you're a true friend, you will not betray me. Now again, you see the context is very important. Here was Peter, guilty of betrayal three times. And yet Yeshua was wanting to mend the relationship and elevate it to the position that he wanted, and that's friendship. Incredible, isn't it? Okay. Now let's... Let me deal with uh, some other issues here. Okay. First time I just asked the question, and after getting the response of Peter, he says, Feed my lambs. Second time, his response, his injunction to Peter was, Feed my sheep. The third time, he also said, Feed my sheep. Okay. So first thing you want to learn is that there's a distinction between baby lambs or lambkins, lambkins and sheep. A sheep is a full-grown lamb, okay? So you want to buy uh, 
lamb, you must make sure that it is a real lamb, a few months old. Anything over a year old is called sheep. And in some countries, you call it mutton rather than lamb. Okay? So, yeah, Yeshua is, is, uh, is pointing to the fact that among Christians, now in our ranks, there are those who are little lambs and those that are full-grown sheep. Okay? And uh, there's a teaching I need to do. In fact, in the Greek, the differentiation is uh, I think a fivefold. You got napios, like babies, padion, toddlers, children. Then you got young men, which are like teenagers. Then you like full grown sons, huios. Different, different words. They use five categories altogether. But here, Yeshua is using two categories lambkins and full grown sheep. Okay, so that's very important. Then you look at the word feed. <laughs> there are two different Greek words. In the first question that Yeshua asked, and he said to Peter, Feed my lambs. The word feed can be translated as teach. Teach. Teach my children. Teach. Then, the second time when Yeshua says, Feed my sheep. Now, the word feed is different. The word feed this time means, means to uh, shepherd. To shepherd the flock. That's right. The word bishop comes with the word shepherd. And Yeshua is a chief shepherd, a chief bishop. So Peter was being appointed as a shepherd to the sheep of Yeshua. Feed my sheep. And the third time was again, feed my sheep. And this time meaning teach my older ones, teach my more mature sons, mature children. So very interesting. In the Greek, the exchange is totally different than what we have in the English version. First, the emphasis on friendship and what it involves. Number two, the mission that he was giving unto Peter, involving Christians from very, very young and immature to those who are mature. And that, moreover, Peter was going to have oversight, uh, oversight ministry. Okay, so let me put, put it uh, more succinctly. Peter, therefore, was appointed teacher, teacher and shepherd to the flock. Okay, now like Yeshua, you see, Peter had learned Yeshua's teaching on the good shepherd versus the hireling. The hireling means someone paid wages to look after the sheep. So Peter was to be a good shepherd, not a hireling, not one who would lord over the sheep and gain financially from them. How do I know this? Peter himself declared to us, in the first letter of Peter, chapter 5, verses 2 to 4, where Peter says, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filter, a filthy lucre, but of ready mind, neither be as lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock, and when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that faded not away. Interestingly, the, 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 the words of the title, chief shepherd, can be translated archbishop. So when you have uh, clergy bearing the title archbishop, it's not quite a title that I'll be willing to use. That belongs to Yeshua. He's the chief shepherd. He's the archbishop overall, whoever is called the bishop. So Peter was having uh, the dual roles of being a teacher and oversight as a bishop, as a, bishop, as a shepherd over the flock to look after them. Okay, And you can see 
He was not to lord it over them. He was to be their servant. He was to serve them. He was not to gain financially from them as so many pastors, preachers, false prophets are doing all over the world. You see, the one thing in the natural, we know that all sheep have got something valuable called wool. So if you've got sheep, you can shear the sheep for financial gain. And likewise, the sheep in the churches and the lambs in the churches have got money. They have their tithes, they have their offerings and so on. And therefore, if you have shepherds over them who are on the lookout for financial gain, you can get quite a lot of uh, wool from the sheep. Okay? So you're not to lord it over them like the Gentiles do. See, all these lessons were taught by Yeshua. He said, don't be like the Gentiles. They lord it over other people. You must be the servant, the duolos, the slave, the bond slave of all. The servant of Yeshua is a bond slave to Yeshua. Must be a bond slave to the church. A bond slave. Paul set such an outstanding example. He never received a stipend from any church. He had a tent-making ministry. He supported himself financially in the ministry. I'm not saying it's wrong to take a salary. Obviously, there's some need, you know. For many people who enter the ministry, they've got families to look after. It's not wrong because a laborer is worthy of his hire. But one must not become a hireling. One must not be covetous. One must not be a lover of money in order to have oversight over the churches of Yahweh. It's a, it's a solemn thing to be called a minister of Yahweh, to minister to the flock. We should do it willingly. We should do it with humility. We should do it to serve our master, to serve the body of Christ. How wonderful if we get the doctrines correct from the Bible. And you can see that the commissioning of Peter was being done in such a way as part of his restoration. And of course, the last few, verse two or three verses, uh, dealt with the manner, the, the last two verses, verses uh, 18 and 19 of John 21. Yeshua was predicting that Peter would die, would die because of his faith in Yeshua, would die as a follower of Yeshua. And meaning that, and if we know from, from the church history that Peter was actually crucified. And when he was being crucified, the story is that he said, put me upside down because he says, I'm not worthy to be crucified like my master. So there you are, you see, complete restoration of the apostle Peter. And that's why when you come to read the two epistles that he wrote, they're very, very precious. Very precious. Very precious. I've learned so much from the two epistles that he wrote. Because this man had the heartbeat of Yeshua. Like John, the apostle. Peter went to an, another way, betraying Yeshua. He must have felt horrible. But yet, he was restored. Not only restored, but put in a preeminent position. How wonderful are the ways of Yahweh. His ways are past our understanding. So now we come to wrap up <coughs> our two sessions. And I must take you through the question. How does one become a friend of Yahweh? Number one, you must make an effort to draw near to him. Look at James chapter 4, verse 8. Oh, James is another epistle that I, I love. It's very short. It's only one epistle of James. But it's packed. It's packed with key doctrines and packed with information. 
they are very necessary for us in our walk with the Holy Spirit. So James says in chapter 4 and verse 8, Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Now, I want to insert a verse there. I think it's James 4, 4. I just quote off the top of my head. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. So, James actually puts a stark choice to us. If we are not friends of God, friends of Yahweh, we are actually his enemies. Because, you know, all of us are friendly to the world. We came out of the world. Many of us are still in the world. And we are very friendly to the world. The warning is, friendship with the world is enmity with God. So, in a real sense, what choice do we have? But to be friends with Yahweh. Do you want to be his friend? First, draw near to him. Now, how do you draw near to him? Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. In repentance, in humility, getting rid of double-mindedness, exposing the secrets of our heart to him and asking for help. Point number one. Point number two, learn to fear him. Now, the fear of the Lord, the fear of Yahweh means to reverence him. Here, if you will look at the King James Version, Psalms 25 verse 14. I've quoted this before. The secret of Yahweh is with them that fear him and he will show them his covenant. The King James uh, translates as secret of Yahweh. But other versions like the ESV, ESV is Psalms 25 verse 14 says, The friendship of Yahweh is for those who fear him and makes known to them his covenant. This is a very interesting translation. Because you see, as I said earlier, it's only with close friends people we regard as true friends, that we're willing to share our secrets. So, Yahweh is the same way. The secrets He's willing to share with us pertain to those or relate to those who fear Him. See, friendship with Yahweh must begin with our wanting to draw near to Him, confessing our sins, humbling ourselves, and then learning to reverence Him. Now, this, this point about the fear of Yahweh, reverencing Him, is something that I find very much absent in the churches. You might, you should know that the Ten Commandments begins with a declaration. I'm Yahweh, your God. You shall have no false gods before me. That's the very first commandment. Very first commandment. Why, why is that the very first commandment? If you want to come near to Him, if you want to come to Him at all, you must acknowledge His sovereignty. So many Christians run away when you talk about the commandments of Yahweh. So many Christians and preachers try to water down, dismiss, reject some commandments here and there. They really do not know Yahweh. You see, if you really know him for who he is, then he's sovereign above everything else. He is the law giver. He does not need to explain himself to us, although he does give us explanations in different parts of the Bible, but not always. You cannot question his sovereignty. He is lawgiver. He is also judge. Don't forget. And the keys to heaven and hell are in his hands. So you want to understand this. Learn to reverence him in the proper way. I, from the very start of my Christian life, 
acknowledge his sovereignty. He is God. I am nothing. I am like the dust of the earth. Whatever he says is not for me to question. I can try to understand with his help. But above all, I must be ready to obey no matter what it costs me. This has always been my attitude from day one when I told Yahshua, I want you more than anything else in the world. And I received the new heart, the new spirit from him. And I've never looked back since that point in time. So the friendship of Yahweh for those who fear him, who reverence him, and he makes known to them his covenant. Yes, just like he did it with Abraham, just like he did it with Moses, just like Yahshua did it with his apostles, he will make known his covenant to us. It's his covenant. And he will fulfill it. He wants us to fulfill our part of the covenant as well. That's point number two. Point number three, we must accept his counsel and the correction that goes along with it. <clears throat> you turn to the book of Proverbs. Actually, the book of Proverbs is a book of wisdom <coughs> recorded for us by King Solomon. So turn to Proverbs 27, verses 5 and 6. Open rebuke is better than secret love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. See that? Pause there for a moment. It's better to have be rebuked openly and a friend will wound you, will hurt you by telling you the truth about you. So, Yahweh to the Holy Spirit will show us what's right and wrong with us in His sight. He will rebuke us. He will send people to rebuke us. But that's okay. It's better to have open rebuke. It's better to have the wounds of a friend than the kisses of the devil. You want to be loved by the devil? You want to be embraced by the devil? You want to be kissed by the devil? Uh -huh. Remember the Garden of Gethsemane? Judas identified Yeshua by kissing him. His betrayal was kissing him. And that's a vivid illustration of being kissed by the enemy. Enemy identifies you, kisses you, for what? That you may be damned. So, faithful are the wounds of a friend. So when Yahweh corrects us, very often to those that have oversight over us, He can send people with a, with a word of knowledge to tell us, exactly what our sin is that we are hidden away from view that we have not confessed and repented of it hurts the truth hurts but it's better to be hurt by the truth than to have the love and kisses of satan take your choice i made my choice number three we have seen that and this is by way of summary obey his commandments john 14 15 if you love me, keep my commandments. You will say, which one? You pick and choose. You have already lost out. You're not a friend of his. Whatever you find in the Bible, obey to the best of your ability. But you also got to, having said that, you got to recognize that, that God has his seasons in dealing with people. And shortly we're going to celebrate Passover Feast of Unleavened Bread. And <clears throat> for those who do not know Christ among the Jews, the rabbis, they will keep retelling the story of the Exodus from Egypt. Okay, endlessly. But for us, we are already gone beyond that. Messiah has come. The Lamb of God has come being sacrificed for us once and for all. So we no longer we we'll spend time retelling the story of Exodus. If we use a couple of sentences to say this is what happened, but Yeshua came 2,000 years ago, 
suffered and died for our sins. He is the Lamb of Yahweh, sacrificed for us. And then we go on to do two things, wash one another's feet, and then celebrate Holy Communion. This is my blood, new covenant. This is my body, broken for you. Take this and eat. So if you love me, keep my commands. That's right. Don't be too ready to dismiss any commandment of Yahweh. And don't you try to change any commandment of Yahweh. You don't change his word. There's a curse on those who change his word, who add to his word, who subtract from his word. Next, a very interesting thought. You see, to be friends with Yahshua really makes us friends of the bridegroom. Because the Bible tells us Yeshua is going to come back as a bridegroom. The faithful among the church, among the churches, the faithful remnant will be his bride. But in any wedding, you've got a bridegroom, you've got a bride, you've got a bridesmaid and so on, the guest, but you have somebody called the best man. So watch this verse, verses. John chapter 3 verses 29 and 30. This is John the Baptist says, He that has the bride is a bridegroom, but a friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoice greatly because of bridegroom's voice. This my joy therefore is fulfilled. Look at verse 30. He must increase, I must decrease. Two things. We are not the bridegroom. He is the bridegroom. We can be part of the bridal group. Or if we are chosen as a friend, a best man, don't usurp the groom's place. That's what John the Baptist said. I'm just the best man. He came to prepare the way of Messiah, okay, by calling for repentance. And look at verse 30. Although he had a significant ministry, baptized a lot of people, had lots of followers, he didn't begrudge Yeshua when Yeshua appeared. And the followers, the numbers of followers of Yeshua grew much bigger than his. His disciples, the John's disciples, who were envious of Yeshua and mentioned this to John. And John gave his response in verses 29 and 30. And like verse 30, he must increase and I must decrease. Can you see that? He must increase and I must decrease. So the more we know Yeshua, the more exalted he must be and the humbler we must be. We are nothing and less than nothing in His sight. But by His grace and by His mercy, He has chosen us for sonship, for servanthood, and for friendship. Sonship, servanthood, friendship. And today's topic is all about friendship. So you are do you want to be a friend of the bridegroom? Do you want to be best man at the wedding? Then you must have the proper frame of mind, attitude of heart, humility that John the Baptist had. Next <coughs> requirement, we dealt with five already. Have a pure heart and speak with grace. Where do I get this from? Look at Proverbs chapter 22, verse 11. He that loves pureness of heart, the grace of his lips, the king shall be his friend. Wow. Wow. If you've got purity of heart and graceful lips, graceful speech, humility in your lives, 
always exalting him. The king himself will be your friend. How you like to be called a friend of Queen Elizabeth, a friend of Joe Biden, a friend of the Prime Minister of Singapore? It's quite something, isn't it? Very privileged position. The king shall be a friend. King of kings and Lord of lords, whom I can call my friend if I have purity of heart and grace coming out from my lips. The next requirement, listen. Hear, O Israel. Hear, O Israel. John 15, 15. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what the master is doing. I call you friends, for all that I heard from my father I made known to you. Can you be privy to secrets? Can you keep secrets? Can you honor the sharer of secrets? Can you listen carefully? Now we see the word listen in English and is equivalent in the Greek do not measure up to the meaning of the Hebrew word shama. Shama, O Israel. Hear, O Israel. And shama actually means hear and obey. Hear and obey. It's not the hearers of the word that's going to be justified, but the doers of the word. The gospel, the word of Yahweh, must be met with faith in our hearts. Faith meaning that you act on it, you walk in obedience to it. You see, throughout the pages of the Bible, beginning with the Garden of Eden, obedience, obedience, obedience is always the issue. That's right. But today you talk about obedience in the churches, they all run away from you. You can see how the devil has taken hold of the churches, how so many preachers are spouting the false doctrines of Satan. Remember, would you prefer to be kissed by Satan or embraced by Yahweh as a friend? The choice is ours because we got free will to say yes, to say no. I have made my choice. I don't know about you. Look at the next one. <clears throat> love him at all times. A friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. Now the last point I've already dealt with that the king will be your friend. It's related to having pureness of heart and grace of the lips. My friend, I, I spent a lot of time researching on this important topic. I have found many, many truths. And the truths that I've discovered humble me a lot. And I share these two videos with you. And I hope you will profit as much from hearing and checking out on the notes that I have prepared for you. If you are coming to this site for the first time, we are totally devoted to Yahweh, His Son Yeshua, and guided by the Holy Spirit. We are based completely on the Bible. We do not manufacture our doctrines. Please take a look at our website, yamiaministries.net. The references below. Whatever we share is entirely free. No donations are solicited ever. Solicited ever. We do it all to the honor and the glory of Father Yahweh. So please take this teaching seriously and recommend to your friends. There's a subscribe button that you can click on. There's also a notification button that you can click on so that when new videos come online, you will be duly informed. And do go to our website where links to all our previous videos are there. 
and all the notes are there in PDF format. Please download freely and then check for yourself, like the Berean Church. Check for yourself that whatever is said is biblical. Now, of course, like everybody else, we are human beings. We are prone to error. Only Yahweh is infallible. Only the Bible in the original languages as imparted by the Holy Spirit is infallible. <coughs> Our interpretation can be wrong. But when we are guided by the Holy Spirit, both speaker and hearers can get at the truth of Yahweh quite substantially. So I commend such truths to you. And I pray that all of us are worthy of being called his friends. Shalom, my friends.